Well, good to be with you as we continue to study God's Word. As uh, Dennis just read, we are in Luke chapter 11, verses 37 through 54. Uh, we will break it, this uh, section into two sermons. Uh, this week I'm going to be uh, talking about the woe of spiritual hypocrisy. The woe, or the condemnation of spiritual hypocrisy. And then next week I'll talk about the six woes. We'll actually get into what these six denunciations are or literally curses that Christ calls down on, obviously, three of them to the Pharisees, three of them to the scribes or the lawyer, who were the theologians of the day. And so this is what we're talking about. When you think of spiritual hypocrisy, what do you think of? Uh, maybe it's easy to see it in others. Maybe you think of uh, you know someone who is a spiritual leader, and then they were indicted of a crime, or, or they, were, uh, they left the ministry in disgrace. Certainly, we could see that. Uh, don't have to look too far. Every single week in a headline, there might be a, a pastor or a priest who's fallen into sexual sin or been divorced or is you know, indicted on corruption charges. And, and that's the worst of, or maybe what, what, what we think of. When I think of uh, spiritual hypocrisy, um, sometimes, or most times, I think I should think of myself. It's easy to kind of look at it in others, but the whole point of hypocrisy is that we assume and we see everything that's wrong in everybody else, and we forget to really examine ourselves and saying, whoa, where am I a spiritual hypocrite? For me, I, I uh, I was talking to one of our elders, Calvin, and he was sharing, and I relate to him how he said that uh, he had to spank one of his, his children recently, and as he was spanking him, he was, he was reminded of some of his own sin he was struggling with and, and how the Lord, you know, how does the Lord spank adults? How does the Lord discipline us, right? And so uh, this week as well, I, I struggled with just disciplining some of my kids and realizing, you know, I'm, I'm still the kid to the Lord. And I, I, I need to be disciplined for all these different things myself. And so here I can see it so clearly in my kids' fault and, and discipline them and, and exercise my authority. And yet sometimes when it comes to, the, to God, I, I want grace, right? And say, Lord, uh, please, you know, and, and I don't know about you, but uh, maybe this is more of a man thing. Usually I kind of feel the discipline of the Lord through my pocketbook. Any of you men kind of equate when things are going bad financially? Things break, and you're like, oh, the Lord's disciplining me. That just cost me a couple hundred dollars because this thing broke or that thing broke. That's how kind of I equate it. And sometimes that's good because truly the Lord does discipline. Hebrews says endure hardship as discipline. And so we kind of equate financial success or things not going well sometimes as discipline. But what are some of the other ways the Lord can discipline us for our hypocrisy? Here, here's one maybe you haven't thought of that I thought of this week. What if you just lack joy? What if you just lack contentment? What if everything is going great? You're, fi- you're, you're killing it in the business w- world. You're, you have nothing in need as far as finances, and the Lord's given you a beautiful wife and a kid and all these things, and yet you're just not a very happy person or fun person to be around. And you don't even know why. Lord, why am I not joyful? Why am I not happy? Why am I not content? And, and there's a smile on my face and I go around moping and, you know, or, or just thinking about the next thing I have to do. And, and I, I wonder as Americans, we have all these things and we just have no time to enjoy them. <laughs> have you noticed that? We get so busy with different things. And I wonder, could that be a discipline for just spiritual hypocrisy in the sense that, you know, we, that we just don't have joy? Perhaps another way that we could be disciplined for spiritual hypocrisy is we have no fruit. How long has it been, I ask this to myself, since you've led someone else to Christ? When's the last time God has used you as instrumentally to see someone be baptized or grow in their faith where you're discipling someone to to know the Lord better? When's the last time you really see God using you to to produce something not temporary that's going to burn someday but truly invest in the lives of people which will be eternal in the sense of soul saves or, or growing in the Lord. I, I wonder sometimes, is, is that not the greatest thing the Lord takes away, is just not having the privilege of seeing the Lord do amazing things in the sense of lives changed? One last thing I would say is, is uh, 
Also, I think that some discipline can come in the just sense that our prayer life or our, our Bible life could just be plain dry. We don't feel that connection to the Lord. And for good reason. Sin always hinders a relationship with a perfect holy God. And we, and, and we sit there and we blame God. Hey, he's, he's not very interactive. He's not very real to me. He's kind of distant. Why is God that way? And, and God's like, well, I'm here all the time. I want to be close. I want to know you. And yet I cannot have anything to do with that sin in your life that you're really downplaying or ignoring. And so just, I don't know if any of those kind of touch base with you today. That we, we so easily see hypocrisy in everybody else and we so easily criticize everybody else. I don't know about you, but uh, I'm married and I know my wife very well and I can so easily think in my mind all the things you know, about Marissa that uh, I would change. And In fact, we used to have uh, you know, these, these times where we would work on our marriage and we would list all the things. And what are the top three things you would change about me? We stopped doing that because it got depressing. <laughs> because I realized that the top three things that are on her list had kind of been there for like 10 years and I hadn't really made much of a difference. Actually, hon, I, I did look at one of them we did a long time ago recently. There is at least a couple. But <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a public apology sermon here today. But, but in that sense that I so easily can see her and yet when I look in the mirror, I forget what are all the ways that I'm just cruddy, hypocritical myself? Or how about just that thought? Now, I know none of you just have a tendency to, you know, to criticize our church or find all the things you don't like about your pastor or the church, but sometimes I'll just find just a critical thought coming up towards a person in this church. And I'll think, where did that come from? You know, that, that person is, is dear to me, or that person... You know, I'm assuming the worst about them, and, and it truly just comes. And I thought, what if one of the disciplines is just being given a, a plain old critical spirit? Where I just realized, you know, I'm not thankful for my kids. Or, you know, we were, uh, for this week, we realized we we're going back to school, and the family's so busy and different things. But the few times that all seven of us were at the table, I just tried to say, Lord, thank you for this moment right now. Because I realize, you know, I, I may not have all five of my kids as my kids at my table for long with Bethany moving away. And I thought, Lord, help me not to miss the moment or not be so busy with this or that that I, I lose the big picture. And, I, and so I, I guess when I, I think of hypocrisy, it's basically when I tell somebody to do something that I might not, my, myself am not doing very well or I'm not willing to do. And I want to ask you, parents, how are you doing in that area with your kids? Are you disciplining them or telling them to do things that you're not willing to do yourself or not doing yourself? I think all of us, when we study this past, can realize the Pharisee is in me. The Pharisee is in me, alive and well. I can so see everything wrong with everybody else, and yet, when it comes to myself, I give myself a pass so, so easily. So that's what I want to talk to you today about. Let's look at our passage here as Dennis already read it. And as, if you're new with us, we're going through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm calling it the Chronological Life of Christ series so that we can know uh, chronologically, sequentially, all the events in Christ's life. We're four or five years in the series, and we're about uh, almost two-thirds of the way done. We have arrived. Uh, we've covered his preexistence, his childhood, his early Judean ministry, and of course, the bulk of the scriptures, the Gospels, cover his Galilean ministry. But we're in the, we just covered his late Judean ministry in the book of John. And now Luke pretty exclusively covers his Perean ministry. So we've been uh, kind of hovering over Luke 10 through 19. And we're in chapter 11, so we'll be here a little bit before we get to the Passion Week and ultimately the resurrection. I found this uh, slide this week to kind of remind us of Christ's life is that uh, many are aware of his birth there in, in Matt, recorded in Matthew and also Luke. But uh, we see that uh, the opening events, they're about four months. And then his early ministry in Judea, where he performed the first miracle in Cana and, and uh, obviously cleansed the temple the first time, where he was really much in obscurity. He was kind of in, you know, not necessarily uh, well-known, but then has this public, after the baptism, 
moves his ministry to Galilee and does all these miracles where he can't even find time to eat. He, he is just obviously amazingly popular where it gets the ire of the Pharisees and, and Sadducees. And, and so that really was about a, a whole year, at least a year, maybe even longer, where he is in Galilee. And we call that the second year of his ministry. Well, really where we're at now is that uh, we have the last year, the really the last third year of his, his ministry, and this is where he is now increasingly opposed, and he kind of, it kind of breaks away and more has private preparation to pass the mantle on to his disciples in and around Galilee, but then he goes into Judea for a while where he raises Lazarus from the dead, and then uh, is persecuted, they're trying to kill Lazarus and him, so I think he's now going around in Perea, leading up to his ultimate sacrifice for us on the cross. So today we're going to cover the lunch. Now, I don't want you to think about lunch, but this, uh, our story today is Jesus having lunch with people trying to kill him. How many of you want to have lunch with someone today who is plotting to kill you? That is really, <laughs> that is the situation that Jesus is in. He goes and has lunch with people plotting to kill him. And of course, uh, it's interesting to know, I'd like to know all that maybe was planned to happen at the lunch. I Probably not real smart to go and have lunch with people trying to kill you. Were they trying to take Jesus down early? I don't know. But whatever, what ends up happening is Jesus gives them such woes and I think exposes them. Maybe the plan is foiled. I don't know. It's, uh, it's a little bit of uh, speculation there. But we're going to look at the six woes next week. And you can see here, warning, 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 warning. We're just going to go into more warnings there in Luke 12. So a little bit about some warnings. If you kind of see, look at these maps, you can see where Perea is. And I don't know if you can uh, see this well here on the left-hand side. Try not to get the hum here. But Perea, why did Jesus go to Perea? I, I think one scholar head, this map actually shows that Antipas, Herod Antipas, uh, was ruling over Galilee and Perea. And obviously as the Roman uh, Pilate was, was ruling over Judea, which the Jews kind of had a religious experience. But I think he went to Perea because the Jews who were trying to kill him did not have any political power in this area. So it was a way to, I, I think, have a freedom and to get away, obviously, because Christ had to die at the exact time on the 14th of Nisan at Passover, at twilight, and this was just part of God's, obviously, sovereignty, knowing the situation in uh, delaying that time to the exact right moment. All right, so let's look at our text. Look at Romans, uh, not Romans, Let's get the right book here. Luke eleven thirty seven. Luke eleven thirty seven. Our first verse says this. Now when he had spoken, a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. And he went in and reclined at the table. So this is a lunch with his enemy. A lunch. Uh, now we're all Pharisees necessarily trying to kill him. And the answer is no. Who's one Pharisee we know who was obviously at least neutral, but even probably more pro-Jesus. At least one Pharisee. Nicodemus, Right. And probably even Joseph of Arimathea, we know that not everyone was invited to the secret trials that were held at the uh, high priest's house because there were a sect. So perhaps it's true there were some Pharisees who truly went just invited them to lunch. But certainly there were some in the midst there that were part of this plot to kill Jesus. So a Pharisee asked him to have lunch with him. And it says he went in reclined at the table. Now I want to remind you uh, how the ancient Jews reclined at the table we see here that the, literally it was a very small table only a foot or so off the ground and they would always recline like in a couch like position with their feet away from the table because obviously the feet were seen as unclean and obviously then they were to then have a, a, a wash their hands and come and have a purity in this table and of course this is going to become an issue here later on it's interesting that the jews uh, from a little bit of research had two major meals a day. One of the reasons I wonder if Americans are struggling with being overweight is we have three. I guess some in Europe have four. But the Jews literally had two major meals of the day. And where we get this word in the Greek, uh, literally means to break fast. You break the fast from going all night, and, and they would go and wake up and work a little bit, and then they would have uh, this time period was usually a brunch, probably in about between the 10 to 12 o'clock area, and it was their first meal of the day after they'd worked a little bit. Now, it's kind of interesting because I, just how I operate, I, I can usually wake up. I usually don't feel real, real hungry for breakfast. 
And uh, I know eating a good breakfast is important, all right? Obviously, those in school do better if they eat breakfast. Please, you know, feed all your kids this year with a good breakfast. But if you go work a little bit, then you come and you really get that hunger where you, it was their, one of their more larger meals of the day because it not only fueled them from the work they did early in the morning, but it fueled them the rest of the afternoon until they would come and have their evening meal at sundown and then they would be done for the day as far as working. So a little bit on the history there as far as the first meal of the day or these two meals. And this word reclining is they would literally fall back and kind of truly be able to relax and uh, just uh, take it easy. So this was the context, this invitation to lunch that turned out to be an indictment. It truly did turn out to be a showdown. Now, we do have, I do have one other picture here because this obviously is, is similar. This w- same word is used at the Last Supper where he's reclining with his, his uh, 12 disciples. Also in John 12, Jesus had a, a supper there, at the, and supper is obviously the dinner, the evening meal where he reclined with Lazarus at the table. So this was kind of a, a picture to see what this was like. And of course, John, the Apostle John, John 13, when he was asking, hey, who's going to betray you? He was the one literally seated next to Christ. Or, and when it says he leaned up on his bosom, he's just kind of, you know, is in a space. Not like any of our kids who uh, lean up against each other in the car and kind of fight over that. Hey, someone's leaning on me, <laughs> right? So stop it. All right, so... This is the, the context here. Let's look at the next verse here, Luke uh, eleven thirty eight. When the Pharisees saw it, he was surprised that he had not first ceremonially washed before the meal. Now here comes the legalism. Here comes the judgmental, how dare you attitude. And he was surprised that Jesus had not ceremonially washed. Now, this was not just a wash your hands for germs, uh, as we would, you know, typical Americans write your mom and tell you, hey, go wash your hands before the meal. That was more than this. They had a process of ceremonial washings, and this was a judgment based on legalism. Sorry, I cut that off there a little bit. But it was, it was based on externals, on traditions that had developed. A specific washing, of pouring out of the hands a certain number of times to then be presented clean to show how holy and distinct they were apart from everybody else. Interestingly enough, this word is the word baptizo. The word ceremony is not actually in the Greek text. It's just baptizo. It's translated as ceremonial washing. But literally, it could be translated, hey, they, and they saw, they were surprised that he had not first dipped or washed before the meal. And so we know this is the same word we use for baptism, all right? This is the Greek word, but to dip or to sink or to immerse. And this was obviously, you know, why was that just such a standard thing? Let me give you a definition of legalism. How, how many of you hear that word thrown around quite a bit, right? Oh, that's so-and-so. They're so legalistic. Have you ever heard that before? Right? Uh, when I think of legalism, I think of, okay, I'll be honest. I think of the churches where if you don't come with suit and tie and the three-piece suit, they look at you like, oh, you're not really a Christian. As if that suit makes you any more acceptable by God than if you would show up with jeans or shorts or anything else. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't wear our best for the Lord, but I don't think that's what the Lord looks on. Where, and, and so here's my definition of, of legalism. Legalism is going beyond what Scripture requires. Does the Scripture say you must wear a three-piece suit or whatever the attire in order to come to church? Does the Bible say that? No. That's a human tradition that's developed through time. So you'll see we're pretty lax here. Now, does that mean that we shouldn't do our best for the Lord? No, but it's up to your individual conscience. I personally don't prefer shorts in church. That's my preference. But... I'd let you know my preference, but it's not a requirement, right? So what's the difference between that and and liberalism? So legalism is going beyond what Scripture says. It adds man-made requirements where the Scripture is silent or where the Scripture gives freedom or where the Scripture leads it to conscience or where the Scripture doesn't specifically forbid. But liberalism is obviously the opposite of that, and it, it takes away from Scripture or advocates freedom to things that the Scripture does expressly forbid. So, for example, in like homosexuality, the Bible does expressly forbid it, and the liberal side of Christianity is saying it's okay, they're completely wrong there. Legalism would be maybe, you know, the three-piece suit stuff or, you know, uh, know, 
no good Christian could ever listen to rock music or no good Christian could ever, you know, um, have a TV or watch any movies or different things. So that, that's what I'm talking about. Here was a, a definition I found in a, a theological uh, journal online. Legalism is called nomism. And Christian thought is the act of putting the law of Moses above the gospel by establishing requirements for salvation beyond obedience, repentance, and faith in Jesus Christ and reducing the broad, inclusive, and general precepts of the Bible to narrow and, re- and rigid moral codes. All right, so can you get an idea? A little, we're kind of a little uh, upped up here on uh, what legalism. This was what was going on, okay? And, and this reminded me when I preached out of Matthew 7. Flip back there to Matthew 7 because this is good. Jesus dealt with the Pharisees' legalism from the very beginning. And I found years ago when I preached on this message, I thought, oh, that's pretty good stuff. I better preach that again. So Matthew chapter 7. How many of you have heard the most uh, over, uh, uh, the favorite verse of unbelievers, the only verse they know in the Bible? Judge, Judge not lest you be judged. Now, I love it the unbelievers quote it in the King James. Right? So they, here they don't talk that way, but they say, judge not lest you be. I'm like, when do they ever use the word lest? Right? So I, I, I don't know. It's funny. It's just passed down that way. And so remember when I preached on Matthew 7, I urge you to go back to this. Jesus is addressing legalism here. And I want us to be careful that we get the right balance of this at this church. Because I'll tell you this, one of the biggest and easy low blow punches towards this church I've heard is, if we stand on the word of God, you know what the easiest uh, smear is? Your church is what? Legalistic. All right? And judge not lest you be judged. And that's just the easy low, it has no merit to, but it's just the easy smear campaign or the easy label to put on something that may or may not be true. And we need to know these definitions and be able to say, here's why we're not legalistic, but here is where what, And and so I think it goes back. I want to take some time to review what I taught here back in Matthew 7. So first of all, Jesus is talking about the same hypocrisy, spiritual hypocrisy, where the Pharisees don't extend any grace or mercy to anybody else, and then they forget how desperately they need it themselves. And he says in Matthew 7, 5, Hypocrite, first uh, cast out uh, uh, from your eye, this is my translation here, you, first, you must cast out from your eye the stick, which you, uh, in order so that you can see clearly the splinter, to cast out the splinter from the eye of the brother of you. All right? And then and in Matthew 15, he says, And the Pharisees invalidated the word of God for the sake of their tradition. So notice legalism, they're adding to Scripture traditions, and in doing so, val- invalidating the word of God. And he says, You hypocrites, rightly does Isaiah prophesy about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. Legalistic people oftentimes advocate rules and they leave out the heart. And so notice this. When people say, well, you're legalistic, I say, first of all, I'm not advocating any rule I can't show you in Scripture. What is it that I'm asking you to or telling or standing for that if I can't point out in Scripture, yes, I am. But if I can show you then, it's not legalism. And no, my heart is for you. And he says, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. But in vain do you worship me because you teach as doctrine the precepts of men. You teach as God's word things that were man-made and man and only, you know, the precepts of men that God didn't actually say or do. So this is what legalism, this is what Jesus is facing. And by the way, all these ceremonial washings, you will find some washings in the Old Testament, but this whole dip your hands seven times, is it found anywhere in the Old Testament? And the answer is no, it's based on Old Testament traditions that had developed out of that over many, many years that now, now they were saying, oh, he must be of the devil Beelzebul because he doesn't wash his hands in a prescribed way seven times and pour the water just right. So this is what we're facing. And I summarized this message, and I think I, want, I thought the list was good. I want to give it to you again. When is it right to judge or correct others? Because in our pride, we want to be corrected. No. All right? So here's, here's, here I want to remind you, when is it right to lovingly judge? It's right to lovingly or judge or correct others when they are Christians and part of the church. 
Is it our job to admonish one another? That's a command. Admonish means to correct or encourage or to spur you to be parallel. The word has the word parallel in the Greek, which means make sure your life looks like Christ. Here's his example. Your life should look like this, not like this or over here. So we are to judge those who are part of the church because they've said Jesus Christ is Lord. And if he's Lord, his word is non-negotiable. And we should always say, well, if he's your Lord, this is non-negotiable. And you've heard me say many, many times here, and I say it again. How many of the commands of the scripture are optional to the true believer? And the answer is what? None. Second, we are to judge or correct others when we are simply repeating what God has already judged and clearly said is good or bad in the scriptures. So we're not making new stuff up. We're simply repeating what God has said. This is what God thinks of homosexuality. This is what God says about this or that. Third, Our motive, and this is so important, our motive in it is to sincerely protect someone, even though I didn't spell that right, uh, to, uh, from the destruction and devastation of their sin. Our motive in it isn't to say, oh, I'm holier than thou, look how awesome I am, and look how stupid you are. No, our motive is saying, sin is the most destructive and detrimental thing in our life, and I love you enough to correct you because if that keeps going, it's leading you to ruin and harm that I want to spare you from. Does that make sense? Fourth, our motive is to sincerely love them and keep them from suffering the discipline of God. It says it's dreadful to fall in the hands of the living God and say, I don't want you to lose God's blessing on your life. I don't want you to lose your joy. I don't want you to lose the favor of God where it says, if you put him first, he'll, he'll uh, prosper you, make you successful in everything you do. I don't want you to lose that. Because to lose that is a terrible, terrible thing. Fifth is our motive is to sincerely restore them. Where they enjoy God's blessing rather than his discipline. Because Hebrews 12 is clear. Does any discipline seem pleasant at the time? The answer is what? No, it's hard. But it says those who allow themselves to be trained by it later on reap a harvest and say, brother, I want you to reap a harvest. I want you to accomplish what God wants you to accomplish. I want you to be successful in God's eyes. I want you to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I don't want you to hear, away from me, I never knew you. Six, and lastly, our motive is to righteously maintain the purity of the church and the glory and reputation of his name because we say, if you claim to be a Christian, you're doing this, people will think that's what Christ supports, that what Christ, and you say, the Lord is holy and pure and we are his ambassadors and we're his, his agents to represent Christ to the world. And if people see no difference in our lives, they say, if that's what Christianity or Christians are all about, no thank you. Well, we don't want to do anything that, that brings a disregard to the name of our Lord. His name is holy. His name is pure. And we're his representatives, and we need to take that seriously. I had a man call me. Never met him. Says he goes to a local church. I don't know which one. The first question he asked me is this. Does your church do church discipline? And I thought, well, that's interesting. I said, uh, yeah, for a small church, unfortunately, we've done it many, many times. As opposed to a church I I, I used to attend, uh, the pastor said, we've only done this two times in 20 years. And I I was thinking, hmm, do we really think there's only been two unrepentant sins in 20 years among a thousand Christians (laughs) that needed to be corrected? Why? Because it's hard to love people enough to tell them what they need to hear instead of what they just want to hear. But we do it for the purity of the name. We do it because it's commanded in Matthew 18. And we do it because it's out of the right, it's the motive to restore. And as we say, it should be called church restoration, maybe not instead of church discipline, because instead of repudiation, we want restoration. So that's when it's right to judge. But let's look when it's wrong to be legalistic. It's wrong to judge others when, and if you look at the context of Matthew 7. This, I believe, is the context when it says, so by the way, when the unbelievers know their one verse, have they ever read all of Matthew 7 or 6 or looked at the context? No, they just, they just sugarcoat one verse and then they are going to do to basically, their true motive is probably to excuse some of their own sin. But what is it, if we look at it, don't judge. Let me just read uh, Matthew 7. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. 
by your standard of measure. So be very careful that you don't ever judge others on externals or preference issues where you don't want people to do the same measure to you. Well, you know, uh, Chad, we don't like your, you know, your shoes or it's true that dad let me borrow a shirt this week and I wore it to church and he said, hey, that's my shirt. I said, yes, it is. <laughs> it's the only shirt that I had on today. Okay. But uh, you know, if you don't like the shirt, then it's dad's fault. All right. Or you don't like, uh, <laughs> at first when we bought the, the, the chairs, they were purple and we said, those are purple, but they kind of grow on you after a while. Who cares what the, you know, and yeah, we, we've, got, uh, we've got some VBS leftover, you know, uh, I guess you call them animal tracks here on the floor. We couldn't get the adhesive out of. But, you know, that, doesn't, that, that irritates me personally, but, but you know, uh, but it doesn't hinder my worship. And I wouldn't take it back because the kids are more important than whatever my little thoughts are at the times. All right? So it says, the measure that will be just you, for why do you look at the speck and not notice the log in your own eye? When we, are, when we have sin in our own eyes, can we see clearly what's going on? I want to remind you, all the judgment that God does in Scripture that we repeat is because does the Lord have pure eyes to see everything the way it is? And the verse that scares me the most, it says, he will judge and expose the secrets of men's hearts. That scares me. Because one with pure and perfect eyes knows every bit of my failures and my hypocrisies and guys, I would just say, if you ever even want any pastor, no, they are all hypocrites on some level. Now, does that mean, here, but here's where a qualified man is. A true qualified man is not, doesn't excuse him. He's working on him. And, 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 and guys, you know that I've asked, and I say it again, pray for me in my big three, because I have nothing to hide. I struggle with anger, lust, and self-discipline, right? To be organize and, and, and pray for those for me because that's just where I'm personally weak. And I'm a hypocrite sometimes in those areas. But man, guys, I need your help to make sure I follow through and repenting to prove my repentance by my deeds that I'm at least progressing and making some improvement in those areas. All right, we continue on where he says, first take the log out of your own eye, then you'll be able to see clearly speck in your brother's eyes. Do not give what is holy to dogs or throw your pearls before swine. And so it goes on there. Let me go on to say next is that, so if we're pridefully judging, it's wrong to judge when we're pridefully judging from our own opinions, preference, or ideas not directly given in Scripture. We are legalistic when we judge on things the Lord has not given the believer freedom to. So basically, if the Bible's silent about an issue, all right, so I, I, would, I would say this. So here, here's the hard thing. We could, we could come say, well, it's wrong for any Christian to ever watch a rated R movie. The Bible doesn't say that, but do most rated R movies take the name of the Lord in vain? And does the scripture prohibit taking the name of the Lord in vain? So for me, there is, we have to be careful in those kind of areas because I had one, you know, Jason Pratt, many of you know, he helped, helped start the church. He said, if I ever hear any, any taking the Lord's name in vain in a movie, I immediately shut it off. I respect that. I respect that. We are legalistically judging on things the Lord has given the believer freedom to or silent about in Scripture. But, so for example, I had a talk with Caleb the other day. We just, I tried to get some time with him, and I brought up the area of drinking. And I said, uh, Caleb, because we drive from our house to our, to our new house, we go right by this bar here, the Hole in the Wall Tavern. And I'll be honest with you, just, I'm discouraged because I see all the people at the Hole in the Wall Tavern Boy, they got, a, they got a pretty good group there going every night. And I'm like, why would you want to go to the hole in the wall? <laughs> I mean, it reminds me of what Paul Revere would do. It looks like you're going back in the 1700s. Get after work. I don't know what's in there, so I haven't been in there, by the way, just so you know. But I, you know, I noticed this, and I made a comment to him, and I said, Caleb, why don't we drink? Why has there been a tradition from grandpa, great-grandpa to grandpa to us where we don't drink at all. And we talk through those things. Now, does the Bible say, thou shalt not drink at all? Does the Bible say that? And I said, okay. But I said, but here's, I, I wanted to talk with him about it. And I said, well, and I listed the, the reasons. We talked through it. And I said, well, the Bible says, do not ever get drunk. And so I said, if someone drinks and they can just drink without drunkenness, but they even get drunk one time in the year. I said, I've never met someone who drinks where they've never been drunk. 
So I said, therefore, I don't think it's a good idea for you. I said, what does the industry stand for? Sex and partying and, and the whole unbeliever mo- mantra that Jesus said about, you know, we live, you know, party day or, uh, you know, live it up because tomorrow we die. I said, I don't want to support anything to do with that industry. I said, third, how does it do, how does it do in my witness? Do people see the separation, the holiness of my life, or do they see a distinction, a purity, hopefully? And I said, I think it helps my witness. I said, how about health issues? Do you want liver problems if you ever got into those things? Uh, and, and we went in and we talked about all those different things. But did I tell him, hey, he can never drink? No, I gave him the reason. I said, here are the things you have to do because here's what it does say. And this is the biggest one. It does say in Romans 13, do nothing to cause someone else to stumble. And I said, even if you never sinned with it and you were having a drink with some buddies from church and one guy was a recovering alcoholic and your drink of liberty caused him to go back into his sin, you are in sin at that point. Do nothing to cause someone to stumble. And it says instead of being controlled by wine, we should be controlled by the Spirit. So here's an example where we would say there's liberty to drink, but there's also reasons in scriptures not to. That's hopefully how you would handle that. Where we see there's some tough issues in there like that. And uh, lastly, I said, how many of the calls of of the police involve alcohol? Local law enforcement said uh, 90% of the violence, rape, and all the ills of our society are connected to this. Why would I want to have anything to do with that? So you see, we got to be careful with this balance. Number three, we are, if we are eventually judging others in order to embarrass them, spite them, or bring them harm rather than good, if it's to slander them or give them a bad reputation, that's certainly wrong. If it's to elevate ourselves, make ourselves look good at the cost of others, it's wrong. If we senselessly judge them and bring them down in others' eyes to elevate or justify ourselves, essentially. If we are argumentatively making judgments about things just to get a rise out of people. How many of you love to play the devil's advocate a little bit and you're just kind of an argumentative person? All right? I can fall into that. i got to be careful that it's not just so I win an argument or I'm right or I'm smarter than you. No. Lastly, we are ignorant or blind in making judgments we have not fully researched or checked out directly from Scripture. I'm in a discussion with a Roman Catholic uh, who goes to St. John's. Very nice man. And uh, he was defending how Mary, he listened to my sermon on Mary. And uh, obviously he says, the one thing you miss is the real presence in the mass. And so I've been talking with him and he, and work in this. And he says, uh, the scripture says that even Gabriel said, hail Mary, full of grace. So I sent him the Greek uh, uh, breakdown of that, which says actually the word for, for hail, it's mistranslating the king, is, is greeting. Right And grace means undeserved gift. And so I give him all those evidences. And he argues out of, well, it says in, you know, it says in these English translations. But what was the New Testament written in? Greek. <laughs> these are translations. And that's the problem. Is he doesn't know the original. He's just taking people's translations. And then there are false interpretations. And he's making arguments on things he really hasn't fully researched or checked out directly from Scripture. A couple more. It's wrong if we are playing God and taking God's place as a judge, jury, or executioner. If we're trying to replace the Holy Spirit and point out everything wrong and not being patient with the weak, but being overbearing, harsh, and insensitive. If we're hypocritically struggling in the same area ourselves or in a similar manner, but perhaps in a different circumstance. That's the hypocrisy. If you're saying, oh, you know, do as I don't do or don't do as I do do. That is hypocrisy. When we are right about the issue, we are judging, but wrong in how we're addressing it, in a, maybe in an unloving attitude or if we're uh, saying it in a, in a very harsh way. Obviously, it says with unbelievers, do so with gentleness and respect. Or it says, And lastly, when we are not remembering to be merciful or considering that God will judge us in the manner we judge others. That's why it says, speak the truth, how? In love. I have to be reminded of this, guys. And the biggest thing I want to say to you is when we see the hypocrisy in others, remember to check it out in yourself first. Right? Remember to check it out in yourself first. Oh, you know, it's easy to find it in everybody else. And it's like, well, have I inspected to see if that same 
root of bitterness or sin is in my heart first itself? Can I give you a little clue, parents, on how you can kind of get a little? Whatever you see in your kids is probably in you. Because they learned it from you. So when Marissa and I are talking about our kids, and we're like, yeah, they, you know, this is struggling with that, and that's struggling with that. And I'm thinking, we're struggling with that. <laughs> right? Because where did they learn this? They learned it from me. And if I see in others, and I see it in my kids, it's probably a reflection of a weakness in me. All right? So, oh, by the way, here's another thing to keep us accountable. All right, so we know that uh, time is my infamous, uh, I should have said, you didn't include time punctuality in your top three? Okay, Dad and I had a long talk about that. The Bible doesn't ad- specifically address time culture things in America, but it does say consider others better than yourself. So hold us accountable. doesn't say I can't ever go five minutes over because we want to be led by the Spirit versus time, but it does say I ought to consider you above myself. So I want to let you know is somehow how we think. Hold the letters accountable that we have, we're the, we know the 10 minute rule. It's 10 minutes margin before, right? So we're practicing. And my kids made it on time this week. And, and, my, and we just backed up, said, okay, if we got to be there at nine, the real time is what? 8.50. Takes 10 minutes to get to church. So you need to leave at what? 8.40. Let's do a better job in these areas that we're struggling in. Okay, a couple more minutes here. The third point is that then we see it turns, I'm back in my text now, in Luke 11:39. 39. Read it there with me. Just look at the text with your own eyes as we kind of uh, summarize these last couple of verses. Verse 39, as I'm staring in the book of Matthew. Luke 11, 39. And it says, But the Lord said to him, Now the Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and on the, pl- and on the platter, but inside of you you are full of robbery and wickedness. Here's a question for us. What's on the inside? Ask your kids, like I've been asking my kids, how's your heart towards the Lord? Is it soft? Is it pliable? Is it willing? Is it selfless? Is it meek? Or is it hard? Is it uncaring? Is it unfeeling? Is it just kind of, you know, um, wrong? Because this is the indictment Jesus addresses here. He says, what's on the inside? He says, on the outside, you look pretty polished. On the outside, you look pretty good. But on the inside, he says, you're full of robbery and wickedness. What an indictment. He exposes their hearts. He says, it's not about the exteriors. And I would say to you, maybe everyone in this church knows who you are on the outside of your presenting self, but the Lord knows who you really are all the time and on the inside, your thoughts your motivations. Here, he tells them, you guys are a bunch of robbers. You're pillagers. You're plundering people. How were the Pharisees this day plundering people? In a religious scam. How many of you like the scams going around, right? You gotta, isn't that terrible, all the scams now in Texas? People posing as DHS agents and all this stuff. And I mean, it's just terrible. They're flying copters around certain areas just to keep all the robbers out. But in this day and age, the Pharisees had extra taxes. Sound familiar? You come in the, in the temple, oh, we got to tax you to enter the temple. Oh, you want to do a sacrifice? Your lamb, we're going to find a blemish with it. You need to buy the temple approved lambs at five times the price of lambs. Oh, and, and you, by the way, that currency that you have out there in the business world, in the temple, we have the temple currency. Oh, and by the way, when we do an exchange rate, you lose about 20% of your money. This was the scam. They were robbing the very poorest of the poor in order to to be rich themselves. And I would say to us all, always look and say, your pocketbook shows your heart, my friends. Can I tell you if you really want to also know where you're, if you're being hypocritical? Not only ask your children or observe your children, see what sins they're struggling with. Look at your finances and your checkbook and I will show you what truly is important to you. Is it the church? Is it missions? Is it others' benevolence? Or is it you? Is it your stuff? I'm challenging this way. I could add a fifth weakness here, but I'm confessing to you. I want to be a more generous person. And you know, when's the last, I've asked myself going into this message, said, when's the last time I've given to the point it really hurt a little bit, where there was some sacrifice? 
Or are we just into being comfortable Christians? And as long as no one takes away my stuff, I want to ask you, if God asked you to give it all up, you lost your house, you lost your job, you lost all your physical possessions, would you do it for Christ? I believe there's coming a time in this nation where the Lord may ask you to do it. And I would say, in your giving, get ready for those kind of situations now by being generous. Because guess what, guys? You're taking none of it with you. None of it. All of it's going to go down except for what you invest in the souls of people. And are we pillaging or plundering and keeping things ourselves like, oh, this is mine. Acts 2 says they shared everything in common. Can we say that? Everything that's in my house, everything that is, is, is supposedly mine is yours and vice versa. I oftentimes wonder, what if instead of having all of us have our individual toys, what if we shared all of our toys? We would have... We would have a lot of toys. <laughs> and we'd have more than enough. Because we don't need 100 boats, we just need one. <laughs> okay? <laughs> or none. <laughs> we don't need all. And I'm just saying, what if we just thought about it a little differently? Finally, wickedness. Jesus says, it's just plain wicked. It's just plain wicked. Poneria. It even sounds wicked, doesn't it? That's poneros. That's horrible. That's evil. That's iniquity. That's what's inside of us. And I want you to just go away from this message and say, Lord, what is wicked in me? Remember, that's what David said. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit. But he says, is there any wicked way in me? Is there any ponderos in my heart at all, Lord? Make me a clean vessel. Open me up. Clean me out. Make me a pure vessel. Because I want to say to you guys, my greatest desire is to be successful in God's eyes, to, to run my race well. I pray that all the time. Lord, I want to... I want to get an A with you and I want to finish the mission you've given me here. Give me the strength to do that. So I hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And right now I want to be a vessel that's not clogged by the cluster of my sin so that God, whatever power he does, he just will blow through it all. So Lord, let me not hold back the blessing. Clean me out so I can be a clean vessel where you just flow whatever power, all of it through me. Do you guys want that? I want that. All right, so we got a few more points there. Hopefully I cover them. Next week, then we'll talk about the, the, the four woes. And I end with this. He says, ultimately, make sure you have a charitable heart. Make sure you have a charitable heart. Make sure you're clean because cleanness is ultimately expressed in charity. And he says, no. He says, but give that which is in you as charity, then all things are clean for you. So there was a part of charity. And I thought this week is, there are some other verses I was going to share. I'll share those to you next week. How many times this week I say, oh, that's terrible about that, what's happened in Texas. Oh, that's terrible about all what those churches are going down in Texas. Oh, I hope, and then, you know, I was telling with our kids, oh, they're, you know, Irma, two paths, they said it could be a, you know, next Sunday, Irma could turn and hit us. It's terrible as long as it's not us. Isn't that oftentimes our mentality? Oh, I, I'll pray for those poor people in Texas. So I don't know what God would have in our hearts to do. But I would just say, Lord, make me someone who pangs and has a mercy and compassion for people. You know, even like these, I don't know if you heard about all these people who, some of them even died. I guess two of them were electrocuted. They were just helping people out and their boat lost power and they went into some electric lines, lost two young men with families, lost their lives, saving others. And I thought, Lord, help me not be a person who just says, oh, stay home. It's safer there. I hope I die going for it, saving people, amen, spiritually. That's how I want to go out. So I, I just urge you to do that. We'll look at the five woes next week. But do you have legalism in your life? Are you just experts of the law with man-made traditions? Are you a Pharisee, a hypocrite? Are you proud, critical, self-righteous? Are you struggling with a critical spirit? Are you seeking man's approval? Are you doing religious things? Are you even coming here out of obligation and out of just mere patterns or you know, routine, but not from the heart or out of love or sincere worship? Are you teachable where no one corrects you or dares challenge you because they fear your reaction? Are you a holier-than-thou type where people don't even like talking to you because you kind of lord it over people? Are you everyone's Holy Spirit? <laughs> Do you always find what's wrong with people where the, caps, the cup's always half empty? 
Do you think of yourself more highly than you ought? That's really I want to end and ask you. Maybe you're even religious but not saved. Jesus says, give yourself with sober judgment. That's what I hope we do and not more highly than we ought to think. Lord, I, I pray that you would work in me and deal with me in all the areas that I'm hypocritical to my children, to this church. Lord, I want to be a clean vessel. Give me a soft, pliable heart towards you that, Lord, grieves over my sin, is broken over my sin, and, Lord, is actively doing everything I can to rid it of the poneria, Lord, the, the sin in my heart. Lord, I, I pray that as you've put on my heart lately with Romans 6, Lord, you said, consider yourselves dead to sin. I realize, Lord, I just wasn't thinking of myself as someone that's not even optional because I am dead to that stuff. I am dead to sin. So God, deal with our thinking. Maybe it's thinking even with punctuality to have a, a margins or to think backwards. Lord, help us prepare for the Lord's day better to give you our best. But Lord, also, guard us from legalism to judge and correct and admonish with the right motivation, to judge according to the word and not preferences or adding to scripture with man-made uh, Lord rules. Make this church successful in your eyes, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.